ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಲಿತೇಷ್ಣುಪಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪೃಷ್ಠಾ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನಾಮಿನೇ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣಿ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶತಾಭಿ ವಾಂಚಕಲ್ಪಾತರುಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧು ಬೇವ ಪತಿ ಪಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭುನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸತಿ ಗೌರವಕ್ತ ವೃತ್ತ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರಿ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರಿ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗನ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ರೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಬುಕ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಬರ್ತ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡೆತ್ we are coming to chapter 4 today the sky beyond the universe will it be possible for someone to read if no then i can read it but in case someone likes to read a bit tired today mata ji <laughs> no no i'm going to read it veena you want to read i am on the tablet i won't be able to see too good so sorry okay okay so i will yeah. read that so yes, if please. if the, the higher planets in this universe are subject to birth and death why do great yogis strive for elevation to them Although they may have many mystic powers, these yogis still have the tendency to want to enjoy the facilities of material life. On the higher planets, it is possible to live for an incredibly long lifetime. So Prabhupada is explaining to us, even though we may understand, oh, life in the higher planets is temporary. The yogis may be able to understand that. why do they still want to go there you know we understand we are going for a holiday it's it's temporary it's for a short time week 10 days 2 months whatever but we still want to go right why because we want to enjoy we like to enjoy the material world so this is the reason the yogis are also striving to go on the higher planets even though they understand it's temporary so the time calculation on these planets is indicated by shri krishna sahasra yuga paryantam aharyat brahmano viduhu ratrim yuga sahasrantam teho ratra vido janaha by human calculation a thousand ages taken together is the duration of brahma's one day and such also is the duration of his nine so krishna is saying this in bhagavad gita chapter 8 text 17 that lord brahma's one day means his 12 hours is our chatur yugas treta um, satya treta yog dwapara yog and kal yog all these yugas four yugas 1000 cycles of these so in one day of brahma there is like 1000 satyog 1000 treta 1000 dwapar 1000 kalyu and these are only 12 hours and his night which is 12 hours is as long so he lives for an incredibly long time one yog covers 4300000 years so this number multiplied by 1000 is calculated to be 12 hours of brahma on the planet brahma lok so the four dwapar treta kalyog and satya combined together is 4300000 so 4300000 times 1000 this is only 12 hours of brahma and as long is his other one night and he lives okay now similarly another 12 hour period covers the night 30 such days equal a month 12 months a year and brahma lives for 100 such years life on such a planet is indeed 
long. Yet, even after trillions of years, the inhabitants of Brahmalok have to face death. Unless we go to the spiritual planets, there is no escape from death. We can see they are living for an incredibly long time, according to human calculation. But even at the end of, of this life, they are going to die. We may say, oh, how can it be they are living an amazing long life? But also on this planet, we can see, you know, like germs, they are born, they reproduce, and they die within, I don't, like, you know, barely few hours maybe of our, of, of human calculation. Or some, some, some insects are born in our night and they die in our morning. So in our 12 hours, they've completed their whole lifetime. They were born, they became big, they had their byproducts, they reproduced, and then they became old and they died. So time is relative. You know, we can see that even on this earth. So similarly, the higher beings, they, they live for a longer time. When Brahma stays manifest, this multitude of living entities come into being. And the arrival of Brahma's night, they are all annihilated. At the end of the day of Brahma, all the lower planetary systems are covered with water. And the beings on them are annihilated. After this devastation and after the night of Brahma passes in the morning, when Brahma arises again, arises, there is again creation. And all these beings come forth. The subjection to creation and destruction is the nature of the material world. So Krishna is explaining in Bhagavad Gita chapter 8, text 18. What is he saying? That you know, when Brahma's, when it's the end, when his day finishes, it's his night, the lower planetary systems, so this, all the hellish planets, this earthly planet that we are on, even up to Swarglok, the heavenly planets, they are also inundated with water. Only the planets which are above the heavenly, like with above the Swarglok, like the Maharlok, Tapalok, Janalok, Brahmalok, only they remain. You know, those planets are like where the yogis are staying, the siddhas, the really perfected human beings. Only those planets remain. Otherwise, all the other lower planets, up to the heavenly planets, the Swarglok is all inundated with water. And that happens every night of Brahma. And when he wakes up again, again he does the work of creation to create again the lower planetary systems. And does, he does this every day. You know, like how we have our work every day. We have a routine, whatever it may be. We have our jobs or our housework. This is what Brahma does. This is his service. So, Bhuta Grama Sa Eva Yam Bhutva Bhutva Praliyate Ratri Agame Avasya Partha Prabhavati Ahar Agame Again and again the day comes. And this host of beings is active. And again, the night falls apart. And they are helplessly dissolved. Gita 8, 19. So this happens like routine. It's a routine. It's fixed. Brahma's night comes. The lower planets are annihilated. So our earthly planets is also one of the lower planets. It's actually a middle planetary system. So all these planetary systems up to the heavenly planets, you know, we have desire that I want to go to Swarglo. We, some of us may have. Oh, it'll be so good to go to the moon or, you know, the other heavenly planets to the planet of Lord Indra, where there is more, more you can enjoy more. There's more things to eat. So more tastes, more time, more fragrances, more beauty for the eyes to see but at each night of Brahma they are devastated and then again when Brahma's day comes again the creation starts although the living entities do not like devastation that devastation will come and overflood the planets until all living beings on the planets stay merged in water 
throughout the night of Brahma. But as day comes, the water gradually disappears. Parastasmatu bhavonyaho vyakto vyaktatsanatanaha yasa sarveshu bhuteshu nashyatsu navinashyati. Yet there is another nature which is eternal and is transcendental to this manifested and unmanifested matter. It is supreme and is never, never annihilated. When all in this world is annihilated, that part remains as it is. Gita 8.20 So Krishna is saying to Arjuna that this material world, there is constant, you see, every night of Brahma. So every 12 hours this is happening. Of course, it's Brahma's 12 hours. So for us, it's like uh, 4,300,000 years times 1,000. That's how many ever years it is. But it is routine. It, it gets destroyed. It gets destroyed. Again, we are created. Again, destroyed. But Krishna is saying there's another world, the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, there is no this annihilation, no birth, death, old age and disease. And even when this part of the world is annihilated, it's devastated in water, that the spiritual world remains. It's ever existing. Ever. That's why it's called eternal. Eternal. Ever, ever, always there. It's transcendental. It's on the spiritual platform. It's not subjected to the to the laws of the material world. We cannot calculate the extent of the material universe, but we have Vedic information that there are millions of universes within the entire creation. And beyond these material universes, there is another sky, which is spiritual. So, you know, we try, we look up in the sky at night, we can see the stars, we can see the planets, we don't even have much information about so many of them. And there are so many other planets and stars that we can't even see because they are much further away. So we, we, we don't have that information. But we can get the proper information from the Vedas. So beyond this material sky, there is a spiritual sky too. Now material scientists don't even have proper information of the material sky. So how can they have information of the spiritual sky? But the information of spiritual sky is there in the scriptures, in the spiritual texts, matters which is dealing with spirituality. So over there in the spiritual world, they are there all the planets are eternal and the lives of all the beings on them are eternal. So in the spiritual world, there is no this annihilation taking place every 12 hours of Brahma and then creation again. No, always exists. And so all the living entities who are in the spiritual world, they never die. There's no old age, no disease. I mean, can you imagine a place like where we don't have to worry that, oh, I'm going to get old or I'm going to get disease. There's no such worry. There's no anxiety in the spiritual world. That's why it's called Vaikuntha. A place of no anxiety. Of, of the, we don't have to worry that I have to die. So, in this verse, the word bhava means nature, and here another nature is indicated. In this world, we have experience also of two natures. The living entity is spirit, and as long as he is within matter, matter is moving. And as soon as the living entity, the spiritual spark, is out of the body, the body is immovable. So in the material world, whatever we are experiencing is a combination of these two, the spirit soul and the material energy. We are the spirit souls, the living entities. Each of us is individual. And then the uh, whatever we see uh, other than the spirit soul is the material nature, earth, water, air, fire, ether, you know, these are products of the, these material, uh, these are the material elements. So we think we are the, we are, we are the body, but we don't realize, you know, once we are out of the body, the body stops to move. It can't move. 
no matter how much one tries. So the activity is coming from the soul, not from the body. The body is dead matter. Like, for example, there's no soul in the building. That's why the building can't walk. You know, how terrified we would be if we would see buildings walking around. We don't see it. Why? Because it's just made up of dead elements. You know, combination of earth, water, air, fire. So here in the material world, everything is a combination of this. The soul and the material elements. The spiritual nature is called Krishna's superior nature and the material is called the inferior. So we, the spirit souls, we are called superior nature. And the material energy, the material elements is called inferior. Does anyone know why? Why the spirit soul is called superior and material is called inferior? Mataji, is it because we are part and parcel of Krishna? Yes, because we are part and parcel of Krishna. And because we are part and parcel of Krishna, we are conscious. The inferior energy also belongs to Krishna, but she's Krishna's separated energy. The elements are not conscious, you know. Like our laptop or mobile phones is made up of dead matter, actually. It's not conscious. But the soul is conscious. And so that's why we are superior. And beyond this material nature, there is a superior nature, totally spiritual. It is not possible to understand this by experimental knowledge. We can see millions and millions of stars through a telescope, but we cannot approach them. We have to understand our incapabilities. If we cannot understand the material universe by experimental knowledge, what is the possibility of understanding God and his kingdom? It is not possible experimentally. You know, we say, no, till the time I don't experience it, I am i don't believe it. I need to experience it to believe it. But then we can't be able to experience everything, right? Even in the material world, we can't say, oh, something does not exist because I can't experience it. For example, if there's a villager somewhere in India, never heard of America, Another of his friend comes. He says, you know, I visited a place called America. And then the villager says, no, I can't believe you because I've never seen it. Well, but then who's at loss? You know, whose knowledge is going to be more closed in? Right. So we can't be that way too. If we want to understand the spiritual nature, then we have to understand by hearing the Bhagavad Gita. We we cannot understand who our father is by experimental knowledge. We have to hear the word of our mother and believe her. If we do not believe her, there is no way of knowing. You know, if a kid wants to know who's his father, he can just simply ask the mother, my dear mom, who's my dad? But And she says, so and so. And so the kid believes in it and in fact has a loving relationship with that person. But if the kid says, no, I'm not going to believe you, I'm going to go and ask each man if he's my father, how successful will he be at coming to the right conclusion? So similarly, sometimes we may be like, oh, damn it, no, I need to have this. I need to, I need to have this experience myself to understand the knowledge. But we are, after all, we are in the material body, so we have the defects the four defects of the material, of the living entity in the material world? Does anyone know? What is our four defects? Is it like we have imperfect senses? Yes, that's one of them, that's right. Imperfect senses. Imperfect mind, if I'm not mistaken. Then Something to do with the mind. And that comes to the same thing. It's imperfect oh. senses. And then we all have a, we commit mistakes. You know, we say to mm. err is human. So we commit mistakes. Mm. Then we are all in illusion. Isn't it? We're all in illusion. And, um, 
The fourth is what's that coming? A cheating propensity. We all have this propensity to cheat others. So because of that, our knowledge can never be perfect. You know, we cannot approach the spiritual from our material platform. So how do we understand that? When we hear, hear from the from the authorities, hear from Bhagavad Gita, from Srimad Bhagavatam. That is the way of knowing perfect knowledge. So similarly, if we just stick to the Krishna conscious method, all information about Krishna and his kingdom will be revealed. Parastu Bhava means a superior nature and Vyakta refers to, to what we see manifested. We can see that the material universe is manifested to the earth, sun, stars and planets. And beyond this universe is another nature, an eternal nature. So here we are able to see this is the material sky, we are seeing the planets, we are in one of the planets, the earth planet. And beyond this sky is the spiritual sky. And in the spiritual sky, also there are spiritual planets. You know, we may think, oh, spiritual world means there's nothing there. It's just Om Shanti Shanti. It's just nothing, just light. No, no. The reality is in the spiritual world. The material world is a perverted reflection of the reality. You know, in the mirror, we see the reflection. Why? Because someone is standing in front of the mirror. The person is there. That's why the reflection is there. Otherwise, where is the reflection coming from? So the, the, the reality is there. The eternal planets are there in the spiritual world. So does it mean that here, because we are seeing reflection, it, it's like false, it doesn't exist? No, it very much exists. It's not false. But we thinking that this place is our permanent home, that is false. That is the illusion. We thinking that we are the body, that this material world is our permanent home, that's the illusion. The reality is we are spirit souls and we need to go back home, back to Godhead. So this material nature has a beginning and an end, but that spiritual nature is sanatana, eternal. It has neither beginning nor end. How is this possible? A cloud may pass over the sky and it may appear to cover a great distance, but actually it is only a small speck covering an insignificant part of the whole sky. Because we are so small. If only a few hundred miles is covered by the cloud, it appears that the whole sky is covered. Similarly, this whole material universe is like a small insignificant cloud in the vast spiritual sky. It is encased by the Mahatattva matter. As a cloud has a beginning and an end, this material nature also has a beginning and an end. When the clouds disappear and the sky clears, we see everything as it is. So this, how we understand this, that the spiritual sky is spreading everywhere. The Brahman, the Brahma Jyoti is everywhere. And in one portion, one tiny portion of this Brahma Jyoti, there is this dark cloud of Mahatattva, where this material creation happens. The creation happens at a particular time. The material creation happens at a particular, particular time and is devastated at a particular time. But the spiritual sky always remains. That's never devastated. That's how we understand that is the, so the material world is also situated in the spiritual sky. But right now it's covered by the Mahatattva, the material elements. Is that okay? So the way we can understand it, we can understand that when the clouds, the, when the sky is overcast with clouds, we can't see the sun, right? But what the clouds are doing, they're covering our vision of the sun. They can't cover the sun itself because the sun is too big. They're just covering our vision of the sun. Similarly, this Mahatattva is tiny compared to the 
the the material world is very small compared to the entire spiritual nature that exists. It's very tiny. So it's just covering us. So similarly, the body is like a cloud passing over the spirit soul. It stays for some time, gives some byproducts, dwindles, and then vanishes. Any kind of material phenomenon that we observe is subject to these six transformations of material nature. It comes into being, grows, stays for a while, produces some byproducts, dwindles, and then vanishes. So we thinking that we are the body, that idea is false. We understanding that I'm the spirit soul, but right now I am in the body, that is the correct understanding of things. So the body, it's the body that is born. Then body reproduces, dwindles, you know, and then it vanishes. Like it starts deteriorating, right? It could be our bodies. It could be even like the flowers, the fruits, the animals, every. Oh, it's all like that. So Krishna indicates that beyond this changing cloud-like nature, there is a spiritual nature which is eternal. In addition, when this material nature is annihilated, that avyakta sanatana will remain. So in the spiritual world, there is no these transformations that we are born and then again, then we grow up. And then we have some kind, some byproducts means we have children and then we become old and we die. This does not happen in the spiritual world. Everyone always remains there. The flowers also don't deteriorate. The fruits also don't deteriorate. Everything is fresh and nice. That's the difference between material and spiritual. In spiritual world, everything is Satchidananda. Material world, we're made up of material elements. And material elements are subject to destruction. You know, we buy something. It has a manufacture date. It has an expiry date. Yeah, that's how it works in this material world. All the material elements are subjected to deterioration. But not the spirit soul. The spirit soul is eternal. If there are any questions, kindly just, or any comments, anyone wants to share anything till on what we have read till now? Okay, so we continue. In Vedic literatures, there is a good deal of information about the material and spiritual skies. So, you know, we want to know about a particular subject, we have to hear from the authority, right? Any, any, any particular subject, we have to learn from the authority. Similarly, we want to understand about the spiritual world, we hear from the scriptures. In the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there are descriptions of the spiritual sky and of its inhabitants. There's even information given that there are spiritual airplanes in the spiritual sky and that the liber liberated entities there travel about on these planes like lightning. So we may think, oh, only we have airplanes here in the material world. No, there's airplanes also in the spiritual world. The difference, our airplane here in the material world is made up of material elements, earth, water, air, fire, ether, you know, different combinations of these elements. What about the airplanes in the spiritual world? They're spiritual. They're not material. They're spiritual air airplanes. And they're living entities there in the spiritual world. It's not that there are no souls in the spiritual world. They are. In fact, the pure soul in its liberated state stays in the spiritual world. Not in the material world. So over there, Everyone is flying about in this spiritual airplanes. Everything that we find here can also be found there in reality. Here in the material sky, everything is an imitation or shadow of that which exists in the spiritual sky. 
So reality actually exists in the spiritual world. And the material world is just like a reflection. As in a cinema, we simply see a show of facsimile of the real thing in Srimad Bhagavatam. It is said that this material world is but a combination of matter modeled after the reality, just as a mannequin of a girl in a store window is modeled after a girl. You know, there's a real girl excess. That's the reason we can make a mannequin of a girl. Or like Prabhupada also would give the example that why do we see a mirage? In the desert, because reality water exists somewhere. That's why we can see a mirage also. The reflection is there because the reality is there. We just have to try to understand the difference. Sridhar Swami says that because the spiritual world is real, this material world, which is an imitation, appears to be real. We must understand the meaning of reality. Reality means existence, which cannot be vanquished. Reality means eternity. So right now we are thinking we are the body. We are thinking we are never going to die. Our identity, whatever our identity may be. Man, woman, born of a particular country, born in a particular family, born in a particular society. You know, that's what we create our identity. But what we have to understand is this identity is temporary till the time we are in this body. When we leave this body and take up another body, then our identity changes. Then we take up another body, then the identity is again something else. So then how can it be a reality which keeps changing? Absolute truth means never changes. Reality means it should be real for all time, not relative reality. So we have to understand that the reality which never changes is in the spiritual world. Our real identity is in the spiritual world. Real hope is in the spiritual world. Right now we are identifying with the body, but that is, that is a false reality. Our real identity is we are all spirit souls, parts and parcels of Krishna. And we need to go back home, back to Godhead. And the more we hear about Krishna from Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, the more we chant the Hare Krishna mantra, the more we can be situated in the reality. Na sato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha, obayor api drishto antastva anyostatva darshi bihe. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, there is no endurance. And of the existent, there is no cessation. This, seers have concluded by studying the nature of both. Gita 2.16 So Krishna is saying in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, text 16. Those who have seen the truth, the Tattva Darshis, they really understand what's the truth. Do what they say? Of the non-existent, there is no endurance. What is non-existent? You know, we are in our body. No matter how much we try to preserve it, how much we try to pamper it, take care of it, but one day it is going to go. No matter what, one day it will go. And then the soul... No matter how much we try to say, I don't want to exist anymore, the soul is always going to continue to exist. You know, many people think, oh, after liberation, I will not exist anymore. I will not have my own identity. I'm going to become another identity. Maybe I'm going to have a supreme identity or something. It's never going to happen. Why? Because we are spirit souls. So we are always going to continue to exist even after liberation. In fact, after liberation is when the real life begins. Reality begins from the point of liberation. When we understand, oh, I'm not the body. I'm a spirit soul. And as spirit soul, I have certain activities. I have certain duties towards Krishna. Devotional service. Those are the real activities of the soul. We, we think that, oh, after liberation, there's nothing. The soul simply doesn't exist or doesn't do anything. But that's because we are keeping on thinking we are the body. Activity is not with the body. The body is dead. Activity is with the soul. 
So after liberation, also the soul will continue to act. So what is it going to do? That's what we have to hear now so that we will know what to do. Needs to engage in devotional service. Real pleasure is Krishna, whereas material pleasure, which is temporary, is not actual. Those who can see things as they are do not take part in shadow pleasure. So how do we understand this? Is We, we are all pleasure-seeking. Ananda Maya Vyasa, the soul is always seeking pleasure. We always want to enjoy. We always want to be happy. Now, we are trying to find that in this material world. Sure, we do find it. But that is very temporary. It's very small compared to the pleasure that we are actually seeking, the pleasure we are actually hankering for. And when our happiness finishes, we get suffering. Then we, we are very upset and we want the situation to change as soon as possible. Why? Because the nature of the soul is we always want to be happy. And this eternal happiness we can find only in the spiritual world. Unending happiness. Real pleasure is Krishna. Krishna is the reservoir of all pleasure. You know, like when we are thirsty, a few drops of water does not help. What we need is like go to a water fountain and drink to our heart's content. So similarly, we are also hankering for this happiness. We are trying to find it here in the material world. But real pleasure is with Krishna. Because he's the origin of all pleasure. He's the, the reservoir of all pleasure. Being with Krishna is when we can actually truly be happy. So the real aim of human life is to attain to the spiritual sky. But as Srimad Bhagavatam points out, most people do not know about it. Human life is meant to understand reality and to be transferred to it. So, you know, we say this is my goal, that's my goal. I have this aim to achieve monthly goals, daily goals, yearly goals. But what is really the goal of human life? This human body that we have been given, which is very difficult to attain. Very difficult. The real aim is for us to understand, I'm not the body. This material world is not my permanent place. I need to, the permanent address, you know, passport also we write. What's the permanent address? There's a residential address and permanent address. So what's the permanent address? That's the spiritual world. This is the reason we are here. So we can understand that we need to go back, back to the spiritual world. All Vedic literature instructs us not to remain in this darkness. Uh, and that's the reason Krishna has given us the Vedas. You know, when we buy any gadget, we buy a TV, we get a manual with it. The manual, why? To know, to, for us to understand how to properly function the TV, to get the maximum out of it. Similarly, Krishna, he created the world. He's given us the Vedas. That's the manual for living. Now, why has he given it to us? So that we know what is the purpose. Why are we here? How we should act? And how shall we get out of it? To this, For this reason, he spoke the Bhagavad Gita 5,000 years ago to Arjuna. So we can understand this knowledge. He arranged for Srimad Bhagavatam to be spoken for us to Get this knowledge. The nature of this material world is darkness, but the spiritual world is full of light and yet is not illumined by fire or electricity. Krishna hints of this in the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita 15.6. So here the material world, it's actually very dark. We'll say, no, it's not dark, not really. But you see, because even at night we have street lights, we have so much light all everywhere. But Go to a place where there is no street lights, no nothing, really at night, you know, like go to a forest or some place which is not modernly developed. It's really dark. So if the sun is not there in the morning, we really won't be able to see anything. But the spiritual world, there is no need of a sun and moon to light the world. The world, the spiritual world is already self-effulgent. It's self-effulgent. The light is there already. The, the Brahma Jyoti, the Brahman. And that is coming from Krishna's body. 
So one may say then are there no sun and moon in the spiritual world? They are there, but they are for the past, for the sake of pastimes, not for the sake of necessity. They are there to make things look, make the sky look more beautiful, but not because there is a need for them. Here, if there's no sun and moon, we won't be able to live in this world. That abode of mind is not illumined by the sun or moon, nor by electricity. One who reaches it never returns to this material world. So once we go to the spiritual world, once we enter in any one of the Vaikuntha planets, we don't need to come back to this material world, which is temporary, which is subject to birth, death, old age, and disease, which is um, in where the happiness is so temporary, so short. We can, once we reach the spiritual world, there's always happiness. There is no suffering. There is no one getting old there, no one getting diseased there. It's a, a blissful place. Just by being in the uh, in the spiritual world, one feels happy. Yes. Just by being happy. And we should somehow or the other get the desire that I want to go to the spiritual world. You know, we have so much desire. We hear our friends talking of some exotic place that they visited and it was so beautiful. Then we also say, oh, I wish I could go there too. So we should somehow or the other try to get the desire that, oh, I also want to go to the spiritual world. You know? Adhiji, I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, this verse says that one who reaches it never returns to this material world. But I read somewhere that all of us were there in the spiritual world with Krishna, but we had a desire to be independent. So we came to this material world. So mm. I just, just want to understand that a little bit more clearly. So Prabhupada, he explains it, that we always have a free will. Mm. And if we misuse the free will, then we will come back here. But you know, once we go back there, like once bitten, twice shy, right? Yeah. We wouldn't want to have that desire again. Got it. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments? No, then let's stop here for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.